you tonight, Lord. We thank you for your many blessings, Lord. We thank you, Lord, Lord, that you are sovereign and that this county is in your hands. And Father, we pray for your blessings upon our leaders and our county. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
So we do have funds available. The guarantee from the not come out of the county pocket
operate the business for us. We don't have that kind of money. Uh, we're operating within our means of what we have, of what the county has approved for us to operate on. And uh, so we have a young lady who was hired as a secretary and receptionist for our office has now been upgraded to a coordinator, an economic development coordinator. And she is making contact with new businesses. Uh, they're being, they're coming by to see her. And uh, some of the things that, um, and her name is Keisha Penny. And we'll introduce her in January. Uh, she's involved in this community theater and she has uh, uh, in rehearsal tonight, so she couldn't be here tonight. She said her apologies. Uh, all the concerns regarding our budget have been addressed, and we are operating within the financial allocation of the development authority. Uh, she has met with the chair with Don Perez, the Chamber of Commerce, and she started to attend the Chamber's board meeting. Keep them apprised of what we're doing and, help, and asking them to help us when they get questions from people coming into town to uh, send them down to us and for us to be able to hopefully answer their questions and give them the information they need. Uh, she'll be attending the uh, North Florida Economic Development uh, Program in December board meeting on December, which she was there in December 6th. Picking up information about new businesses wanting to come to Florida, uh, new businesses wanting to relocate that are in Florida and want to come up to North Florida and get out of South Florida. And there's quite a few of them. So uh, we we're talking with them, uh, and she has met with uh, Mr. Chancey Jones of the Small Business Development Center. Mr. Jones is a consultant for small startup businesses looking to establish a business here in Taylor County. He also helps the existing business with uh, business evaluations and also government contracts. So she's been working on that and, and we're working with him hand in hand. Uh, I've been working with Mr. James Lawrence and Ellen B. Logistics who is trying to find the right property for expansion of gold that he has for his business. Uh, he is trying to set up a new business and we're trying to find the proper place for him to have enough room for him to operate the business that he wants to operate. <coughs> and it's our understanding and talking to him that when he gets in full strength he'll be employed about 200 people. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, he's talking about maybe 16,000 square feet of building place and then uh, about five acres around it where he can pull a foot and all. So uh, we've got several leads on some that are available. It's a matter of contacting the owners and trying to work with them to see if we can work out a reasonable uh, price for them. Uh, we're also, we've been put in touch with Mr. Jeff Lawson, development Director for the North Florida Medical Center. <coughs> Mr. Loss is looking for property towards the expansion of a North Florida Medical Center here in Taylor County. Uh, also, uh, many of you have heard uh, that Kimry has been sold. Uh, they are in the process of waiting for government approval for the company that bought them because they're out of the country, uh, but they own eight other plants in the United States. And when they come in and take over, their anticipation is, is to double the size of Kimber. That means a lot of jobs. So we are working hand in hand with them. Uh, I've, uh, Talk to some of the folks that work out there, work in what they call the White House, and uh, they're putting me in touch with the uh, head man out there so we can sit down and talk to them about what we can do and how we can help them get set up and 
anything, any questions we can answer from them, and we might be coming back to the county to have not the money, but there's some <coughs> advice and maybe some uh, suggestions of what we can do to help them get their business going the way it needs to go so we can put some people to work out of Penn County. Uh, if there are any questions that you might have. Did I read that it's the largest, this will be the largest employee that they have that in hand? That's what I understand, yes, sir. Any other questions? Any more? Okay. Well, Wallace, I want to thank you for your leadership. You're doing a really great job. And uh, thank you for being here tonight. And we look forward to seeing you every month. Thank you. We'll have Sean ready with us next week. Thank you so much. Well, my name is
what his neighbors have come to enjoy through their decades of ownership. So Don Michelle Curtis had a civil meeting for Mr. Stokes and his team leading up to the planning board meeting, uh, and they were hoping that their concerns about this project would be addressed. And the Curtises were uh, encouraged, excuse me, to put their concerns in writing. Uh, and so they did that. They hired attorney Tommy Reeves to draft those concerns into the form of meeting. Uh, the night before the planning board meeting, uh, Mr. Stokes declined to execute any kind of planning agreement. Now, to be fair, I didn't get a copy of the agreement until the day before the meeting, but nonetheless, he declined. But he did make certain promises to the group. And it's an email dated 10 to 19, 6 p.m. from Mr. Stokes to the Curtis. And we're going to make several promises. One, we'll create baffles on the lighting to protect some light pollution. Two, we're going to handle dredging costs and include your property. Not that that has to do with one thing or the other, but that was a problem. Okay. Three, we'll build a low-profile dock, and we'll have cover docks to come out no further than the sight line from your deck to the southwest corner of the condos in the distance. You're going to see a map of this. They're talking about from the Curtis's property looking out to the west, northwest, you're going to see wood marine condos. The idea was um, there were going to be covered boat clips, but they would not come past this line between Curtis property debt and the Woods Branch condo. Um, there will be a small gazebo at the end of the dock, all right? Um, and it would be as little impact as possible to your view and minimize the impact to your view, okay? And then lastly, uh, there was some concern because the initial concepts that were discussed during this meeting, there would be uh, not rocket parties, but parties in the evening and music and maybe bands and that would be outdoors and there was some concern and the issues raised about the existing day of the county and the way it So that's where that was being addressed, saying that was vilified by the day of the county and the And then see lastly here, we don't intend to enter in any deed restrictions because in their experience, that can become an item. Okay, but the, what's highlighted those are the promises that are made the night before planning. All right, so in hindsight, it appears they made these promises in order to get the Curtises not to oppose this planning board meet, meeting the following day. As the Curtises later found out, Mr. Stokes had already submitted plans to the Army Corps and to the Water Management District that showed that he had no intention of keeping those promises. <coughs> For instance, March 22nd, 2019, the Commission's Water Management District. 20 by 25 foot pavilion. This is the small gazebo that we're talking about. That's not, you'll see, in any uh, document anywhere in the plan that's submitted to the planning board. You'll notice March 22nd, when it was submitted to the Water Management District, here's the gazebo, no, no, no. and the covered boat houses that you're going to see later don't even show up on the drawing. They also don't show up on the drawing that's submitted to the planning board. Of course, the application wasn't relative to DOC, so that argument can be made. But we'll circle back to that. November 19th, so after the planning board is over, now we send the revised DOC, and by we, I mean the applicant sends the revised DOC to the Water Management District, and look what we have here. We have the covered boat houses on the stop. And you'll notice that this is the existing DOC. You see that now the amended plan has the DOC moving even closer to the Curtis property. And you'll also see that now that we've passed the planning board phase of uh, these variances, the new submission of our management just shows that the existing dock covers 2,600 square feet. They plan to rip it out and triple it in size, 7,000 square feet of dock, both dock and under roof. None of this is known at the time of the planning board. To the planning board or the Curtis. Submission to the Army Corps. You notice. These were plans that were submitted many, many months ago. And you see, this is the dredging concept. And you see, you know, the Curtis property, no dredging. Now, the Curtis just don't care if the applicant dredges for them. But the point is, is that the night before the planning hearing meeting, we promised we'll dredge, no cost to you. <coughs> that's, a, that's a pretty big commitment. But you see here, well, before that, that was never in the plan. So the water management district plans on November 19th that were committed. Again, you see this is not here. This was submitted to the Army Corps many, many months ago. And look what we have. And your screen's a little bit fuzzy, but that's what makes your hard copies as well. You'll see this is the dock plan from 
committed to the Army Corps. This structure here is highlighted. If you can't see all that well, that, that's the uh, mean high water. That means your average high tide. And then highlighted next to it is, you'll see five feet. So this structure is going to be the base of it. It's going to be five feet off of the mean high tide, the average high tide. And then the number to the right of that is 14 feet. So this small gazebo that's going to be built to minimize the site impact, we're talking 19 feet off of the high tide. Now, in order to build this grand vision, Mr. Stokes gave the county to give five variances so he could exceed the Taylor County Code in five different ways. And we just now learned that they have two to four more variances uh, that they've applied for before the county coming before you. So not just these five, there are more coming. We call that incremental permit. So the idea is you put a few before the board and then, okay, they approve those. And when you bring the next step, then the argument can be made in board was you approve part of our plan. If you don't approve this part, we're going to have to change the drawing board. And so the, it becomes a little bit of a, 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 the ability to argue that point to the, the planning board. So there's more. I don't even know what they are. I called today and requested a copy of them. Um, and Mr. Greiner advised that he submit a request for additional information. But at some point, I'll be able to get a copy But there's more coming. But we don't know what those are, neither did the planning board at the time they were received. <coughs> he did tell his neighbors or the county or the planning board the full extent, extent of what he really had planned, nor did he tell his neighbors there will be many more variants of what's to come. They didn't know that. The planning board did. We didn't know that. Notice that the plan submitted to the planning board didn't go into great detail, and they don't even show the dots. This is where they cut off. Well, Mr. Stokes, and his team, and they've been very nice and very hospitable, but at some point it, it became an impasse. But they needed no one to show up at that first planning board hearing and oppose the request. They needed to get that first foot in the door. That way it would be harder to deny the later variance request. And to keep anyone from showing up at that first meeting and opposing it, two things. One, you didn't disclose the full plan. And two, made promises uh, that there was no intention to keep when offered the ability to let's put something into a writing. Uh, no, those things can be nightmares. But I'll, I'll just put it in an email. Not, not, a, not a contract. Not something that would protect the Curtis Venture. So Michelle Curtis appeared at the hearing and advised the planning board that although she did not oppose the concept of the marina, she did have concerns related to light interference noise issues and the blockage of the view. A man by the name of Ken Bailey, who um, wasn't able to be here tonight, he appeared, and he owns property just north of the marina, and he advised the planning board that he was opposed to the high variance and the setback variance, and he was very verbose about that and his reasons why. But this gives you an idea of why. To do the Lord's rendition, this is Ken Bailey's house right here. This is the footprint. Now, you see the white on the ground um, right here? That's the actual plan that was submitted to the county planning board as they were laid on the board. And then the actual building footprint on that plan raised to just short of 60 feet, which is what they are wanting to build, 60 feet tall. All right, this is Mr. Bailey. This in red, that's the view that Mr. Bailey has, or the access to view that he has, that will be gone when this 60-foot tall structure goes up. 
Minister Stokes had his first flight variance request approved on October 3rd, then more details began to emerge. The Curtis has been fined out until November 14th that the quote low profile host list coverings and the quote small pavilion were actually going to be 19 feet above the mean high tide. The average high tide. We were talking about this before you cut it off. Keep working on it. Keep working on it. The buttons are tiny when you need it. Thank you. 
key for a submerged land lock. And so what they would do is say, this is what we would like to do with it. And DEP can decide whether or not to lease them for that intended purpose. So for instance, the last lessee that held the property from DEP wanted to put in those docks for commercial landing work because it was a steam engine fish out. And they wanted both to be able to come apart, drop their loads, and leave that dock or that lease. Specifically said no overnighting with those. This is temporary parking basically for commercial vessels. And so but that lease is not expired. They would go to DEP and ask for a new lease and then tear it down. So they're early in the process. As far as I know, there is not a lease in place with DEP. But they have to go to multiple different um, governmental agencies. If they want to do the dredging and put in the stuff, they've got to ask the Army Corps, they've got to ask the DEP, they've got to ask the Army and they have to ask the county. Right. So we're the county part of the process for a portion right now. Now, the book you gave us is nothing hasn't been approved by anything, right? The planning board has approved certain things. I'm just trying to explain to you how we got to the point of coming to an impasse with the developer. And then I'm going to discuss specifically the five things that they have for variance. Now, as to those docks, you have a code section that addresses those. Um, but the developer at times has said, well, that code doesn't apply. And that code section is 42436. It says, number three, all docks must be consistent in use with the adjacent upland riparian owner. I mean, the adjacent person that has water rights. It's hers. It's got to be consistent with their use. I don't think it would be in uh, compliance with that code. No dock or covered dock or pier can be more than 30 feet out. Now, the existing ones further out, the majority of grandpa, we're going to break it out. And then, no dock or pier can exceed four or 500 square feet of dock and portion of the roof. The developer has taken the position that at least a certain time that this is not supposed to be done. Now, this isn't what the variance request is about, but this is what led us to butting heads with them to say, no, we have big concerns. Um, and it now appears to be the case anyway that the idea all along was to take the permitting process in small bites, get the first few approved, and then when you come out for the next one, everybody kind of feels obligated that they need to approve it. Right, and eventually we'll get to the dock portion where they want the variances for the dock, and they'll say, well, you've approved everything else. If you don't approve this, then our whole plan is All right? And then when somebody finally speaks up, the response could be, probably would be, you should raise that at an earlier time, which is why the services are here to you at step one. Not waiting for other agencies, although we'll be here with them when the time comes, uh, but every agency that this developer appears before in order to put in this very, very large thing with a whole lot of people to the property, right? We're going to oppose it. You just have to be the first step. This is what the Curtis family and friends have made thousands of memories together at this house. And on in 2002, they paid 7,800 years dollars a year in taxes. That's 125 grand since they've owned it. That equates to $650 a month just to have a view. The Curtis's and the Bailey's should not have to let the developers come to our county, tell us what we need to hear in order to not show up and oppose it, and then do whatever they want to do. This is the digital rendering. You see this, this uh, area here that's highlighted? That is the now obstructed view uh, from the Curtis deck based on that building and that building. The Curtis is that's not acceptable. <laughs> this is the current way of view. And that's what it would be with it blocked out. That. That's what they pay the county $650 a month for, is to have that view and to have family photos. But this is what it would look at like. It's like that's my brother and his first kid and his wife, but let's take the sunset out of it, and that's a whole different picture. <coughs> now, as an aside, side note, we wanted to reach out to, to each and every one of you and explain the services position. However, this is technically a quasi-judicial proceeding, and so we're not allowed to reach out to you, otherwise it has to be disclosed on the record. And so um, I always want to tell the board that it's not that this wasn't important to us and that we didn't care. It's not supposed to have contact with you about it. It's really you're serving in a, a little bit of a judge role right now. So the appeal hearing itself, variance law. A variance is generally permission for a landowner to go outside the limits of the zoning code and to build something which would otherwise be illegal. That's what variance is. And the rationale behind it is that if you applied the 
exception, all right? Uh, a special exception is when a use is specifically authorized, so long as meets the conditions, the variances, or this use is not authorized. But if there's no other reasonable way to use the land, then we can authorize. Every application has to be reviewed on its own merit. You can't look next door and say, well, we approved it for this guy, so we got approved for this guy. Case law says no, and your own county code says no. There is no precedent set. And generally, a variance is authorized due to circumstances unique to the property itself and not shared by other properties in the area. <coughs> and mere economic disadvantage due to the owner's preference of the property is not a basis for a variance. For example, in this Coral Gables case, the purchase of buy the land with a condominium uh, and with a condition creating a hardship on it, then the hardship is real self-created. You don't buy something and say, oh, this zoning code makes it where I can't do what I want to do, I have to get a variance. No, that's self-created. You bought it knowing the condition existed. And a gentleman in the second row here pointed out, that was a big building for an narrow strip of land. Yes, and this property was purchased, it's still a narrow strip of land, it's still subject to the same zoning codes today. In this other case, the appellants brought unimproved property, and they said, well, we expect to be 